This is our annual lecture, uh, which is often but not always about a, a recent or in-progress book by somebody who's writing in the field of international business. And I thought, you know, what could be more perfect or relevant than talking about the many private and public law implications of digital technology, regulatory frameworks, and sort of the interplay of many of the big economies. So we are so happy and pleased to welcome Professor Anu Bradford from Columbia here tonight to uh, tell us about her book. The students who are the International Business Law Fellows have been reading the book this semester, and we've really learned a tremendous amount from the text. And I think that both Professor Bradford as well as our panelists will uh, really help illuminate many of these issues. So to help us with the discussion, we have Professor Tom Lee from Fordham, Professor Jeremy Sheff from St. John's, and our own Professor Christina Mulligan, who are going to sort of uh, concentrate on different aspects of the book. So we'll hear from Professor Bradford for uh, her talk, have some commentary from the panelists, and then really looking forward to opening it up to all of you to give some questions and comments. Um, and I want to just end my introductory remarks by saying a few things about the law school. So first of all, we are so thankful for the support of our um, event staff and administration here. Liz Alper, as well as the rest of our event staff, always just do a tremendous job helping making these events possible. So we are so grateful to her. Uh, very grateful to our dean, uh, David Meyer, who's uh, in attendance here. Um, support of the center has been tremendous. And the last thing I wanted to say is that this weekend we lost one of our dear colleagues, Larry Solon, who was a real friend of the center. He was actually, he was never a director of the center, but he was on our um, committee. He was somebody who, when I joined the faculty, was the associate dean, incredibly supportive of the work that we did, and um, I just want to say that his memory is really with us tonight. This is the sort of event he would have been at, he would have really loved, and uh, I, I think that having this sort of talk about global affairs is exactly the, the kind of thing that would have made him extremely happy. So I give to you sort of the memory of Larry Solon. Um, and with that, I will ask Professor Bradford to uh, speak about her book. Thank you so much. Can you hear me OK? Perfect. So Robin, thank you so much for this invitation. And thank you all for, for joining the conversation. Um, I have had the opportunity to talk about the book a fair bit, but it feels particularly special to have a conversation in our great city and uh, alongside my fellow uh, New Yorkers. So um, thank you for having me. So maybe a few words on uh, why, I write, why I wrote Digital Empires. So I start from this premise that there's increasingly now a global consensus that technology needs to be regulated. But there is no global consensus on what that regulation ought to look like. So I argue that we have three different ways to think about governing digital economy. We have the American market-driven regulatory model. We have the Chinese state-driven model. And a European, what I call a rights driven regulatory model. So let me just walk you through the assumptions under each of these three models. So the American market-driven model really focuses on free speech, free internet, free market, incentives to innovate. The government is reserved only a trivial, trivial role, and the governance of technology is basically handed over to the tech companies themselves. So it is a techno-optimist, techno-libertarian view of the world. The Chinese have quite a different view. So under the state-driven model, China is very focused on making the country a technological superpower and prepared to deploy state resources to meet that goal. But the Chinese government is also deploying technology as a tool for surveillance and censorship and propaganda in an effort to entrench the political power of the Communist Party and ensure social stability within the nation. 
So in this conversation, Europeans are often described as being forced to choose between the Chinese and the American digital worlds, lacking a robust technology industry on their own. But I argue that the Europeans are not willing to, nor are they forced to, choose between the US and China. The Chinese model for the Europeans is simply too oppressive, whereas the American model is too permissive. So the Europeans have pioneered their own third way forward, which, is, uh, which rests on this notion of a human-centric digital transformation, where the protection of fundamental rights of individuals, the preservation of democratic structures of the society, and achievement of a more fair distribution of the gains from digital economy takes the stand, center stage. So the Europeans are prepared to transfer power away from the large platforms to smaller companies, to individual users, and to the society at large. So these are roughly the three models that I focus on. Um, but there's one question, why do I call them empires? Um, so empires, it's a big word, it's a provocative word, and I use it more metaphorically. But I think it is also conceptually helpful for us because none of the three regulatory models are confined to the jurisdictions themselves. Instead, each empire is proactively exporting its respective regulatory model and in that process expanding its own sphere of influence. But what is interesting to me, they're all exporting something different. So the U.S. is expanding the reach of the American digital empire primarily by exporting the private power of its tech companies. The U.S. tech companies were set free to take over the world, and that is exactly what they have done. Their products and services are used by citizens all around the world. To take one example, Meta's Facebook has over 3 billion users in 160 countries. That is part of the American digital empire. China is primarily expanding its own sphere of influence by exporting what I call infrastructure power. So Chinese tech companies are building 5G networks, undersea cables, data centers, smart cities, safe cities, exporting surveillance technologies along what is known as the digital Silk Road and extending the reach of its digital authoritarian model across many parts of Asia, Africa, Latin America, and even Europe. So what are the Europeans exporting? They are exporting this superpower that they have, which is regulation. And this now builds onto my earlier work on the Brussels effect that captures this phenomena, how Europeans are able to often exert unilateral power over global regulation. So the EU is one of the largest and wealthiest consumer markets in the world, and very few global companies can afford not to trade in the EU. So as the price for accessing the European market, they need to follow European regulations. That's not confusing. Where it gets interesting is that often these global companies choose to extend the European regulation across their global production or global conduct because they want to avoid the cost of complying with multiple different regulatory regimes. So simply by conforming to the European regulations, including its extensive digital regulation, they can often then access all the markets around the world. So if the first argument of the book is that Europe is also an empire, this is not just about the US versus China. The second argument is that we don't see a full decoupling of the tech uh, world into three separate spheres of influence because each empire is contributing a different layer to the digital tech ecosystem. So we have many markets where you at the same time have US tech companies, Chinese infrastructure, and European regulations regulating those tech companies and that infrastructure at the same time. Which then means that these empires are also colliding. They come into conflict in many markets. So I speak a lot about those conflicts in the books. In the book, and I, I distinguish between two different types of conflicts. I talk about horizontal battles and vertical battles. So horizontal battles are the battles between the empires themselves. So most prominent battle being the US-China tech war which is a battle for technological power, for economic power, um, geopolitical power, even military power, with very strong ideological undertones. 
But we also have extensive uh, horizontal battle between the US and the EU, which are mainly regulatory battles, whereby the Europeans take the view that US tech companies have entered the European market, exploiting European consumers' data, uh, leaving Europeans surrounded by disinformation and hate speech online, abusing their dominant position on the marketplace and stifling competition, and as a result are asserting their regulatory powers. Just today, two billion fine against Apple. And that has led the Americans to often say, look, it's not our companies that are overreaching, it's your regulators that are overreaching. So that is another horizontal battle we are observing. But at the same time, we witness these horizontal battles. Each empire is fighting vertical battles in their own territories. And those are the battles between governments on one hand and tech companies on the other. But here, what is interesting to me is that these two layers, two levels of battles are intersecting, which introduces elements of restraint to these battles. So even the US is now considering whether it ought to engage in those vertical battles and start abandoning the techno-libertarian instincts and actually regulating the tech companies. But that conversation on whether to start deploying antitrust laws, whether you have a federal privacy law, whether to move ahead regulating AI, takes place in the shadow of that horizontal battle against China. And the US can go only so far in pursuing that vertical battle with vigor because it needs those tech companies to prevail in the horizontal battle against China. So that's why we actually see more restraint, and at best, a half-hearted effort to pursue that vertical battle. So let me now move on to the, the question, what probably interests you the most, which is who wins these battles? Who prevails? Who wins the horizontal battle, and who wins the vertical battle? And I'm prepared to make a couple of predictions here. So the first prediction is that the US is losing the horizontal battle, at least the ideological battle. The world is increasingly moving away from the market-driven model. The citizens want more regulation. The governments around the world no longer trust their companies and their self-regulation. And I mention even Americans no longer really trust the world of self-regulation. And even in the US, if you look at the public opinion surveys, the people are supporting more of a European-style rights-driven regulatory model. And you see both parties in Congress proposing bills trying to upend the status quo and introduce more regulation. So if the US model is retreating, that is good news for the European model, because in much of the democratic world, the governments are moving towards a variant of the rights-driven regulatory model. But I have three concerns about the potential European victory here. So one concern is whether that model is ultimately fundamentally incompatible with innovation. Europeans are very good at generating regulations. But if I ask you to name a European tech company, it might take you a while. But you are all very quick to name the GDPR. Europeans are more famous for their regulations than their tech companies. So that gives Many Americans do hesitation. If we move towards the rights-driven regulatory model, what happens to innovation? I'm very worried about the state of European tech innovation, but I don't think digital regulation is the problem. That is not why the Europeans are lagging behind. I give you four other reasons that explain much more where the technology gap between the US and the EU can be traced to, and it's not the GDPR. And if the EU now decided not to move forward with its uh, brand new AI Act, it's not that somehow five years from now all the AI companies would be emanating from Europe. So, Something else explains the Europeans' lack of technological progress. One is there's no integrated digital single market. There's still many fragmented uh, barriers that the tech companies face. It's much harder for tech companies to scale across those regulatory differences, linguistic differences, and so forth. Second, there's no integrated, deep, robust capital markets in Europe. So they, the European tech companies do well in the first few funding rounds then they need to turn to US venture capital or acquired by US tech giants. Third, Europeans are really prevented from taking risks because of the punitive bankruptcy laws and because of the culture that is very averse to risk taking. You fail in Europe and you're done. In the US, it's like a rite of passage. You go, you raise money, 
you start a company, you fail, and then you go and raise money again. And they give you money because it seems like you're working on really big things. And in Europe, it just, it's, it's, it's basically reputationally too costly. And that's why you don't undertake these investments in innovation. And the fourth is immigration. The Americans have been able to recruit from the global talent pool to get the best innovators into the US. Over 50% of the over billion dollar startups in the US have an immigrant founder. And that explains much more why the US innovates rather than the idea that because they have not enacted a federal privacy law. And if the US were to move towards European model, that would not dismantle the capital markets in this country. That would not rewrite the bankruptcy laws. That wouldn't prevent the immigrants from coming here. So I spend a little bit of time on this because I am really tired when I hear this kind of idea that the, the Europeans cannot innovate because they only regulate. There is much more, I think, fundamental story about the differences in the two, two tech ecosystems. I'm much more worried about two things for Europe. One is that it's not that they overdo the regulation, it's they are under-regulating. They are not good at enforcing their laws. They pass those laws, but the enforcement record leaves a lot to be desired. A third issue is that the European model is doing really well in the democratic world. It is not doing well in the authoritarian and authoritarian-leaning world. That world looks to China, and they like what they see. So I think there is a very good chance that the Europeans and Americans cannot persuade much of that wide world of the benefits of the model that is founded on liberal democracy. And there are two reasons I want to mention why the Chinese have a certain advantage here. One is that that infrastructure power is really fundamental. These countries want first and foremost a path to digital development, and China is providing them one. Their infrastructure is good, and it's affordable, and we don't provide them an alternative. Second, and I'm really uncomfortable making this next remark, but I think it is true and it needs to be said, is that China has shown to the world that freedom is not necessary for innovation. They have managed to create a thriving tech economy without being free. And for anybody like myself who's a huge proponent of liberal democracy, it is hard to admit we like to think that everything good stems from our free model, but it is hard for us to tell those countries and say, you choose to follow China, all you get is control. You will not get innovation. They look at China and say, well, it looks like I can have both. So let me now end with the what I think is the most important battle of all, and what are the stakes in this battle. And that builds directly on what I said about China. The biggest battle is about the future of liberal democracy. And I, I want to invite you to think about that we can lose that battle uh, one of two ways. One is if the US and the EU and their democratic allies lose the horizontal battle to China. But liberal democracy also will be eroded if the US and the EU and their liberal allies lose the vertical battle to tech companies. And that might also happen. This country is basically unable to legislate. They tried, but we see nothing coming out of Congress. The Chinese Communist Party is not unable to legislate. If China decides it's time to crack down on big tech, guess what? It is time to crack down on big tech. The Europeans can legislate. They have a hard time enforcing. The Chinese Communist Party doesn't have a hard time enforcing. The Chinese companies or American companies trying to compete in the Chinese market are not taking the Chinese government to independent courts for decades and trying to prevail. So unless we can show that there is a liberal democratic model that can, can actually also in practice govern technology, we are forced to concede that, that digital economy is governed either by authoritarians, whereby democratic governments fail in that same endeavor, or it's governed by tech companies. And neither is consistent with the idea of liberal democracy, because then the true digital empires would be the authoritarians or the tech companies. And anybody who believes in liberal democracy as a foundation of a digital society should be very uncomfortable with that conclusion. So let me leave you with that.
Oh, thank you so much. Uh, we're now going to hear from our panelists. We'll begin with Professor Sheff, uh, then we'll hear from Professor Lee, and then Professor Mulligan. Great. Um, well, thank you, uh, Professor Bradford, for those bracing uh, <laughs> remarks. Uh, in the summary of this really just uh, spectacular book. Uh, extremely rich and dense uh, and covers a tremendous amount of what's going on in the world um, uh, with tremendous reach. So in my comments, I, I, my understanding is I'm invited here to be the tech guy. Uh, I'm an IP guy mostly. Um, uh, and. Uh, uh, and so that's where I'm going to focus. Um, and so to start with, uh, I want to ask a little bit um, whether we have a good handle on what we mean by tech when we're talking about this, uh, this set of concerns. So um, when you say the EU doesn't have a you know, major tech company, I said, well, wait a minute. Um, there's uh, a lot of discussion in this book about the, uh, the semiconductor war going on between the US and China. And there is really just one absolutely indispensable company in the semiconductor industry, and it's a European company, it's ASML, without whose uh, photolithography machines you cannot make uh, the most sophisticated semiconductors, the most sophisticated chips uh, that uh, we all rely on for the, the, the coming wave of, of new technologies, particularly AI. Um, and ASML is incredibly important in, that, in this trade war, and the, the links between um, American semiconductor design companies and Taiwanese semiconductor fabrication companies uh, runs through and has as its linchpin ASML. Uh, and, you know, the Dutch government just revoked a very important trade license that, to ASML that they were using to continue to, continue to provide these, uh, uh, these uh, machines necessary for the manufacture of chips to China uh, just two months ago. Uh, which I think supports the thesis that the, the trade war is increasing and heating up, um, but also I think suggests that the linkage between the U.S. and the EU is running both ways, uh, that the EU is largely getting on board with this trade war, uh, 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 particularly with respect to these sensitive technologies. Um, and so uh, I think when we talk about tech, uh, one of the things that I think this concern over uh, uh, the battle between liberal democracy and authoritarianism uh, is focusing on, especially, is the way that citizens interact with tech, in particular, uh, those tech companies that influence us in our daily lives. None of you know who ASML is, uh, even though they're, you know, a $400 billion company, uh, because you don't buy their products and you don't interact with their products. Their products are used to build the things that run the things that you interact with on a daily basis. Uh, the, the chips that build the computers, that run the software that you interact with. Uh, and the concern, I think, is that that software is going to potentially be used to do bad things to us as members of uh, liberal democratic societies. And I think that's clearly the case, uh, though I think there may be some hidden theoretical questions we have to ask ourselves about uh, as about being citizens in a liberal democracy that we don't like to ask ourselves that I'll come to at the end. Before I do, I want to talk about the, the other area of tech that um, it seems that this book is concerned about and a lot of us are concerned about, and that's AI. Um, so with respect to AI, again, it's being the tech guy, I, I, I kind of cringe at the, the name AI because I don't think it refers to anything in particular. Uh, but, and, and I think if you read the AI, uh, the EU's AI Act, I think they also kind of punt on exactly what is AI. There was a, a kind of a more detailed description in the proposed uh, text that kind of got muddied up in the, in the version that's actually uh, now being enacted. But if AI stands for anything, I think it probably stands for something that is not what we have traditionally relied on computers to do, uh, which is to substitute for human judgment using predictive models built on any number of strategies that are not deterministic algorithmic strategies. Uh, and those kinds of technologies are coming, they're here. Uh, and uh, one question that we might ask is, is this something that calls out for holistic regulation or is it something that I think uh, we could approach the way that I think the EU AI Act does, which is to focus not on the category of technology, but on the use cases and the harms that might arise from those use cases, uh, which is, I think, a strategy that the EU regulatory approach is, is moving towards. And I think 
probably one that we are also likely to see in the U.S. Um, as we uh, start engaging in more regulation of these, uh, these tech spaces. Um, and on that score, I think the U.S. has actually gone a little bit farther than the EU with respect to some regulation of AI test cases, particularly in my field of IP. Uh, so European uh, countries are look, taking kind of a wait and see period with respect to uh, AI generated artifacts that might be protected under intellectual property laws, AI authored uh, graphical works or literary works or, or what have you, AI created inventions. Uh, whereas here in the US, we have said absolutely not. Those things are not going to be eligible for legal protection under the intellectual property laws of the United States. Um, and that is a major distinction between the U.S. and the EU right now that uh, is leading some people to think that the EU is actually going to attract more investment in AI to the extent that uh, the products of AI are going to be easier to monetize there. Um, and so that's an area where I think maybe the roles are a little bit reversed. Uh, it, where uh, really it's the, the, the EU that is doing less regulating, at least of this family of outputs of this technology, uh, whereas the, the U.S. is taking a harder line on it. Okay, and that brings me to the, the last bit, the part of technology, the part of tech that we all interact with on a daily basis, our social media feeds and accounts and, and what have you. And this is the area where I think uh, we are rightly concerned uh, that uh, these tech companies are allowing their services to be used uh, to influence uh, what goes on at a uh, political level in liberal democracies, to manipulate our elections, for example. Um, and here, I think we have to think really hard about what we mean by liberal democracy and whether it's the democracy or the liberal that's more important to us. Um, because, you know, to the extent that you see a post on your social media feed, and it convinces you to vote a certain way. Well, that's democracy, right? You're, you're expressing your views based on what you think best. Now, maybe you made that decision in a way that we think is flawed in some way, but you know, that's not a democratic concern, that's a liberal concern. That's a concern with how societies ought to reach decisions particularly when they're reaching those decisions based on procedures that take inputs from the constituent citizens in those societies. That only works if the citizens who are empowered to make those decisions make them in a way that we think is reliable. Um, and this is actually something that the area of IP that I've written a fair amount about, trademark law, has been struggling with since the 40s uh, in an article by Ralph S. Brown in the Yale Law Journal where we where he expressed significant concern about how consumers' preferences were being influenced, changed, manipulated by advertising. This new kind of national trend of advertising that you saw in like Mad Men and other uh, 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 celebratory views of, of, of how the commercial and consumer economy in this country got built. And it depends very heavily on the idea that consumer preferences can be changed or even created. Uh, and that you know, is something we've been deeply ambivalent about for a long time, and now that it's affecting our, our, our civic institutions, uh, it's something that has even more salience. But from the perspective of the idea of, let's say, consumer autonomy, the idea that this is what I want because I like it, and who cares why I like it, I just like it, it makes me happy, is something that, you know, I think most Americans would say, all right, fine, who's getting hurt? But now somebody's getting hurt, mm. right? Uh, and, and the question is, well, does that mean we have to abandon this idea of consumer autonomy based on people just making whatever decision that seems best to them? Uh, if so, you know, we're engaging in a, a bit of paternalism, perhaps, perhaps defensible paternalism, uh, but we're going to have to figure out which grounds are sufficiently justified to engage in that kind of control over the permissible influences over consumer preference formation or voter preference formation. Uh, and in, in, in particular, uh, what limits uh, we think go too far in the opposite direction of limiting the ability of, cons of consumers or voters uh, to obtain the kind of information that they might find valuable even if we think it will lead to bad by our lights decision making uh, to results that we might not want to see in a liberal society, uh, which is I think a real danger here in the United States, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, so that's, I think, I've spoken for long enough, and I'll, I'll leave it up. Great, thank you. So, um, <clears throat> Professor Lee, go ahead. 
Um, so I, I wanted to say something very quickly, quickly about Larry Solon. Um, when I was on the job market in 2000, I still remember Larry Solon, who uh, you know I had an offer from Brooklyn, and he was sort of um, the one who I remember the most because his enthusiasm, his obvious love for the uh, place, and his intellectual sort of energy uh, was very memorable. So I can only feel the depths of your pr profound loss here. Um, and um, Professor Bradford has written a marvelous book, and you could tell she's given this spiel at least 100 <laughs> times because you really did a very efficient job of um, uh, unearthing the different moving pieces. Um, I'm going to approach the topic from a national security perspective. So I, I do several things, but national security is one of the things that, that I have some experience in a, a, and I've written on. And um, I'm going to talk about sort of what I learned from the book and my impressions. Um, y you know, right now, the conflict with China is very much in the minds of all national security people. Um, and I guess I didn't quite s understand until I read the book the extent to which there is a component of internal technology regulation as to how we can succeed in this conflict, right? So so I can remember my colleague Zephyr Teachout and Tim Wu, who, 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 who gets a shout out for being, um, you know, like, oh, we should definitely ban TikTok in your book, right? Uh, and I remember when th their big thing was we've got to break up Facebook and we've got to break up big tech here. And uh, this was 12 years ago. I said, well, what about China? China then did not seem like a realistic threat. And it was interesting to see. They said, well, China's never going to be Facebook. Uh, and that was before TikTok was on the horizon. It's interesting to read here. I didn't know until I read it in your book, I knew that he shifted gears and said, said that that's actually what we should be doing. So it's, so it's interesting to see... Um, um, that particular transformation in, in somebody's a thought leader's idea. So, so from a national security perspective, um, I want to say two things. What is the threat? And I think um, Professor Bradford's f from China in particular. Um, and um, one is, I think Professor Sheff was talking about content manipulation, like the ability, deep fakes, and, 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 and the ability to sort of um, use misinformation to corrupt American um, the the processes, democratic processes in in other countries, including the United States, liberal democracies. Um, the other is the accumulation of data. Um, and I was just at a recent meeting of national security types, and they're talking about how AI has enabled um, the the Chinese and other adversaries. They've collected so much data that um, they can predict American moves, like strategic moves, for example, because they have, the AI can actually analyze the data and play out different scenarios, right? And so it's, it's almost as if you had a future mind reader that could effectively tell what the United States is gonna do under various scenarios, a plane is shot down or whatever. And, and the Chinese really are doing this, apparently, right? Um, the AI is not as sophisticated as it could eventually be, so, so if you collect lots of data, you, could, you have more information to, to make the AI model um, American strategic decisions, individual decisions, if you're interested in making money as opposed to, to winning the war. And, and this is sort of what the national security uh, authorities um, view as potential threat. I'm, I'm going to hopelessly date myself because prior to law school, I'd been a, a, um, a naval cryptologist. And I remember very distinctly... In the old days, intelligence worked. The national command authorities would identify priorities, and they'd say, like, look, we want to know where the Russian missile submarines are. We want to know how many of these silos they have. We want to know what the technology is, and, and the national command authorities would identify collection priorities, and then the collectors would go out and collect it, and they'd feed it back to the, the national command authorities. And then I sort of saw the technology where the whole process was reverted, uh, converted, and, and, and essentially we have the technology to essentially vacuum up huge amounts of data, <laughs> put it in libraries or storehouses, and then use analysis to crank it through whenever we need it rather than sort of this pinpoint collection, right? And so this is sort of in a microcosm of what's happening to the world. And so, so we fear 
we fear this accumulation of data. Um, a couple of other, other aspects, um, you know, the Russians and the North Koreans, they're not really so much about accumulating data for strategic analysis. They just want to make money out of it or hack or, or whatever. Um, um, it, a big concern now is you know, technology transfer and dependency on Chinese companies for essentials and particularly digital infrastructure, right? So one of the topics that the military is discussing is so-called going dark. Um, it used to be uh, our Navy is very much grew dependent on GPS, and so now they're teaching celestial navigation again and teaching, teaching our military to operate in an environment where they cannot rely on digital technology and getting them used to, to being able to operate um, so that they can so-called go off the grid, right, and, 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 and rely on, on satellites. Space law is a, is a big topic because there's the sense that the Chinese are really moving in there and we have to sort of Create a, create a world in which our national security institutions can operate without this reliance. And so these are some of the, the big topics going on here. And, and I guess the last point, and these are just observations because Professor Bradford's already written the book, right? And so um, I, I'm just riffing on what I thought of. Her, her main point about how the EU model may be a good... Um, option for us now and how, depending on the contextual factors, it does not mean that you're going to give up the innovation that is, has been a critical hallmark of, of you know, U.S. success, both as a political matter. I mean, we we're political innovators. The written constitution was an innovation, um, technology innovators, um, that, that you don't have to worry about that if you go to, to more of a um, top-down regulatory model. And I, I guess... I think, and, and she says this, to some extent we're already there in, in, in certain respects. We're, we're, we're not at the same point we were when the internet came, which incidentally, the internet was a military invention, right? Um, there are institutions like DARPA, um, the extent to which the United States technology success has been due to the fact that we've invested so much into our military over time is, is something that I would have um, been interested in, in, in um, seeing a little bit more of in, in the book, the extent to which the United States has always operated in a free market defense posture, and we've we've a lot of our technological spin-offs have come from from military um, um, technology. Um, I, I guess I guess um, with regards to the right protection aspect of the European, so the European model has a certain regulatory more trust in the state as regulator, which I think is absolutely right in the United States. Um, we, we don't want to break up big tech. We don't have quite as much trust in the, in the state as regulator. And the other feature is sort of data protection rights. She talks about the GDPR. Um, and it's interesting because in this respect, I've been involved in litigation against something called the Corporate Transparency Act. On a Friday, a federal court struck this down. This is a statute that requires every um, beneficial owner of, a, of an entity that's set up under U.S. law to report their... Um, personal information to the financial intelligence unit of the, the Department of the Treasury, right? So, so the United States has been extremely more so than the Europeans. The Europeans had this kind of centralized corporate database for much longer, and it hasn't occasioned the same kind of resistance. Um, so, so the European um, Union is much more right perspective, rights protective against private industry, not so rights protective against state industry. And I think that against the state, and I think that that's a real defect because the American suspicion of state regulation um, um, is something that is in a, in a lot of ways a counterweight to, to the Chinese model. And as we see in the EU, the expansion of the membership has led to real friction in terms of certain members of the EU that don't seem to have the same... Um, yeah, they're all members of the EU, so they've signed on to the formal human rights mechanisms, um, but they're not as bought into the rights in practice, and this is the enforcement um, promulgation gap that Professor Bradford also identifies. Um, you know, in that world, rights can be fairly cheap, right? And so, so maybe I, I prefer, in a, in a weird way, um, the idea that rights are for um, against the government, because that seems to me the antithesis of the, the Chinese model. <laughs> All right, so 
I think I want to talk about three interrelated things. Uh, two are two theses of the book that I just want to play with. One being, um, it, sound, it, it sounds like you think the EU model should win on balance. Uh, descriptively, that whether or not the U.S. model is losing, and also how to characterize the U.S. approach. And I think it, right now I've been teaching internet law, and so I think about regulating the internet in three buckets, right? There's um, the physical infrastructure, right? The ISPs, the computers, the wires. There's the allocation of IP addresses and domain names and the protocols for how things talk to each other, that kind of, those sorts of governance decisions over who gets what and how things are moved around, how information is moved around. And then the kind of application or platform side where there's particular companies that have products like Facebook and YouTube and that's like a big subject of the book. Um, so it cer certainly seems like on the, that the application section and the other two might be thought of quite differently. And so I want to talk for a second about uh, applications and then, and then talk about the other ones a bit. Um, so one of the things that I thought was quite interesting in, in the book was, was the discussion about how there may have been a real movement in the United States after situations like January 6th, where people say, you know, there's so much misinformation online, people are being, you know, their views are being distorted, we need to regulate better, so there's less hate speech, less manipulation of people's views. Um, but what I think has been so interesting is that just um, two weeks ago, a week ago, um, the Supreme Court heard what uh, the, the net, the choice, net choice, choice cases about whether um, two statutes in, in Texas or Florida were constitutional that would, would regulate a lot of what could appear on social, uh, on social media companies, but would have the opposite effect of the one that you desire, that, the, that, that seems to, that would be desired to come out of, of that previous discussion, where the, um, uh, if, the if the laws are upheld, um, the kinds of discussions about, you know, that some would say are fake, or many that are fake, um, and, and very incendiary discussion by political candidates would be forced to be kept online. And so I wonder if perhaps um, not just regulation, but culture has a major role, and perhaps e the ability to regulate in the European style would just come out very differently in the United States because there's so there's such a different culture here. And you know, the First Amendment gives as good as it gets. I think I would prefer to live in the world where the net choice, where the statutes at issue at net choice were unconstitutional, but we still couldn't regulate um, in the European style. So that's just, that's just a note about whether the EU should win. And also, this is a giant area, and we can definitely cannot delve into all of the real nuances. So that's just one anecdote that I think is interesting to think about. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to talk about, which is interrelated, is whether um, the U.S. the U.S. is losing, and how to characterize the U.S. approach. You know, the 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 book characterizes the U.S. approach as market driven. Does in the description of it talk about the the political philosophy underlying that of as being freedom and, and liberty oriented? But it's it's the the discussion tends to be focused on the companies and the businesses and the economics. But I, 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 I don't know how to think about the internet without thinking about that like joy in freedom and liberty that really instantiated the early internet culture. It's so, like half as uh, Thomas was saying, or not, not half, but many, so, you know, the military did build ARPANET, but with so many technologists outside of the military who had this very techno-libertarian philosophy that wasn't at the, you know, about, you know, primarily about making money, many of them wanted to make money, but was also just about this like joy in discovery and freedom of communication and democratizing who had a say in the world. You know, little, you know, and, and there are all these little stories about early internet entrepreneurs and figures that um, I just think are beautiful and like need to be part of the story and I think are part of the American approach. Like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were phone freaks and they loved hacking the phone system when they were in college. Um, 
the in my in my internet law class we talked for a little bit about and this totally did not work about um, two entrepreneurs that tried to build a data haven on a on something called Sea Land, which is an old w, World War II like uh, piece of thing that the British just left there that has been that some uh, people have been hanging out in and declared an independent country. And there, anyway, it's fun, it's wild, it's crazy. Um, Tim Berners-Lee inventing the World Wide Web and making it so that you didn't need to ask anyone's permission to put a link on something, allowing anyone to talk to and refer to anyone. A European, by the way. A Euro <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> but, um, but there's this, you know, there's a lot of terrible, terrible stuff on the internet. The worst stuff in the world is there, but also the, the best stuff and this, this joy and this freedom. And I think you can't think about the American approach without thinking about that as well as the, the market and the economic side. And that approach is still extremely present in, um, in the, on the infrastructural side and also on the, inter the pure internet governance side. Who gets domain names, who gets IP address, how ICANN is governed. Um, yes, for a long time, the United States held on to the idea that it was ultimately their decision who controlled these critical internet resources, who got IP addresses and domain names, but the, that was because the Clinton administration had the instinct that the underlying free philosophy there was the right one, and they wanted to sort of stand silently in the background and say to other possible entities who would interfere, don't interfere because we will, we will make it a problem. But they pretty much stayed out of it. And then finally, in 2016, ICANN was just spun off to be purely private and to embrace that, that multi-stakeholder governance model. And you might say, like, hey, so we have, you know, and, and this is how the internet is organized. It's private. Um, but there's so many people jockeying for who's going to have influence. And it, it, despite the fact that this sounds kind of nuts, it seems to work OK. And just as one explanation of it, you know, when, the, when, when IP addresses were first allocated, no one knew this was going to be like an important thing. And so random companies and universities got one 256th of all IP addresses. So like for a very long time, the continent of Africa had the same number of IP addresses as MIT. But they've given it back. And the, you know, the sort of consensus and pressures of the multi-stakeholder model has reallocated things in a way that people would find much more appropriate and equal and equitable. Um, so anyway, all of that to say, um, I, you know, the, the American approach is, is super not perfect and there's a lot of really ugly stuff that is part of it. Um, but there's, but I want to talk about the beautiful stuff um, because I think we talk about Mark Zuckerberg now more than we talk about Tim Berners-Lee. And I think we should, you know, as, as Steve Jobs said, quoting the, uh, the, um, uh, Whole Earth Magazine in his Stanford commencement speech. We should remember to like stay hungry and stay foolish, even while the U.S., the EU, and China are battling out the regulatory landscape, because that beauty is still there. Great. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I'd love to open it up to you, questions and comments from all of you. If you raise your hand, I will bring a mic to anyone who would like to kick things off with comments. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, the book is fantastic. Um, it, the, the argument's compelling. It's, it's super informative. Um, and, it, and it's, uh, despite how much information there is, it's a real pleasure to read, so thank you. Um, my, my question is, how much of the regulatory battle and competition hinges on who wins the, sort of, the competition for tech dominance, or the innovation competition? Um, I, I read the book as, as saying, you know, it, it does depend on it. And if that's the case, it seems a lot depends on the conclusion that, well, China really has shown us that innovation d doesn't depend on freedom. And we can't really pin the EU's sort of lack of innovation on its regulatory regime. And I was with you for, for m most of the book, but I'm not 100% sure I'm with you with those two conclusions. Um, the, the first one, uh, the first reason being, one that you acknowledge, right, that so much of China's technological development has depended on technological transfer from the United States. So what, ha it's, it's, what happens if that's cut off, even if progressively at this point? Um, 
so I guess that's that's the first question: is how much are these are these intertwined, um, and how confident in the conclusion are, uh, in that China's able or has shown the world you don't need freedom to innovate? Um, and then th I guess the second question is: that we see, you know, th there's there's evidence in the United States that we that we actually are starting to believe that China has shown us this, right? With the Chips Act, we're yeah. we're sort of adopting their model in a way. And I wonder how you feel about whether we can replicate it, whether we have like the state capacity to, or the patience, not having you know five year, ten year economic development plans and being on a four year you know presidential um, race. And okay, I'll, I'll, we can talk. The last thing I had, the last question I had was um, whether, and you don't have to answer this, but just to throw it out there, what this means for sort of cooperation between the U.S. and China on AI, um, just thinking about sort of the, one of the last warnings that Henry Kissinger made before passing away. Um, so anyway, thanks a lot for the book. Fantastic. So thank you. And first of all, thank you for extremely thoughtful and provocative comments. I think I would just want to do justice to all of them and, and engage at length. But but maybe now I just I, I just uh, respond to you, um, Strata. So, so first of all, um, I think there are several explanations for why China has been successful in innovating. And I think we can also think about sort of different layers of innovation and where China is excelling. I still think that the United States is uh, ahead of China when it comes to foundational breakthrough innovations, including in AI. But China is very good at applications, which also is very significant when it comes to commercializing technologies uh, and uh, sort of developing different variations and bringing them to the marketplace. That's not all dependent necessarily. It may be that the foundational technology comes from the US, but they build on that in an innate, very effective way. Um, there's the story. Some people say it's all espionage, it's all stolen technology. I think um, there is no denying that espionage is a big uh, part of it, but there's also a lot of innate capabilities. So Chinese have certain strengths. Uh, one of them is that you talked a lot about the access to data. They generate a lot of data. They have a vast domestic markets and very few limits to surveillance, and their population spends a lot of time online. I still think there that the U.S. has probably an advantage in having access to more diverse data, global data, compared to China, but that data is very significant uh, for, for China. They also have extremely skilled researchers. So I was trying to look at different studies to measure where the AI talent is. And it is fair to say that most of the AI talent is still in the US. So if you look at uh, NeurIPS, the most prestigious AI conference where the top researchers sub uh, submit their papers, there was a really interesting empirical study where the researchers looked at where did the accepted papers come from. And 60% came from US institutions, Google and Stanford being the, number two, uh, num the two top uh, institutions. But then they looked at where did the people, the researchers working in those US institutions, got their undergraduate degrees from? 29% China, 20% US, 18% US. A lot of the Chinese talent is Chinese talents that we have just been able to harness, hence my point on immigration being a tremendous asset for the US. Very few researchers around the world globally dream of going to China, but many still dream of coming to the US. So in many ways, that just shows Chinese are very good. They are good researchers. They are innovative, but we often have managed then, for many of them, provide the kind of path, a market where they do want to bring their innovative capabilities. So that's just to say that I don't want to dismiss that Chinese only copy what we do. We also benefiting a lot of innate research done by Chinese and Chinese educated uh, uh, researchers in the domain of AI. So, but I think there's a lot now going on. Uh, you talked a lot about on um, ASML, the most valuable European tech company. I'm glad we can at least, you know, I can point to ASML or Spotify that, you know, there are some companies, but, you know, it should be a long list. I would yeah. love for it to be a long and diverse conversation, but yeah. it's not. <laughs> but AMS, ASML, I am just full of admiration for what they do. But nobody is sufficient when it comes to semiconductors. Nobody can declare technological sovereignty self-sufficiency. Neither can the Chinese, nor the Americans, or the, uh, the Europeans with the ASML. So that's one thing with the, when it comes to uh, how badly China will be impacted by a set of US restrictions 
to chips exports, and there the U.S. has certain advantages being able to have a set of allies, including the Europeans and Japanese on board. So I think China is struggling a lot in developing because they are not in the highest end of the value chain in AI. So we will see how much actually they will be impeded. We have seen that these sanctions are, are not airtight. There's still a lot that, that can be done to circumvent the sanctions. And we come to the, uh, the, the point what you said that in many ways the U.S. is trying to, U.S. is playing China's game. So the U.S. is no longer really true to its market-driven model. Partial is trying to emulate the European rights-driven model. That's where the public conversation is moving. The government is emulating the Chinese model. And China is very good at that game. And ultimately, we have certain reasons why we may not be as good at that game. We have a lot of companies with tremendous lobbying power, and they are pushing back very hard. They are big losers if they cannot have access to the Chinese markets. They don't like export controls. They don't like investment restrictions. They don't like the idea that they cannot be underwriting those deals necessarily for stock listings in New York City. So there are lots of losers in the U.S. corporate sector if we are closing off the market to China. And the relationship between the corporations and the government is different in the U.S. than it is in China. And ultimately, the U.S. companies are more effective in pushing back against the government. So I think there's also, and then the, the commitments ideologically to free market, there's still not, we have done industrial policy across the decades, especially when we do it in the name of national security. And we did it with the ARPANET and the others. But there's also this, this really interesting work by Friedberg um, on the sort of Cold War, like what ultimately explained that the U.S. prevailed over Soviets was that we were ultimately leaning on to our commitment to free markets and did not overdo the role of the state in the economy. So we always remain more efficient. Uh, than the Soviets. And I think ultimately there are limits to how far we go in trying to prevail through subsidies and export controls and investment restrictions. It's a massive balancing between our national security and commercial interests. It's a balancing for China, but that balancing, I think, in the, the American political economy will entail that our sweet spot is not to lean too heavily on the state-driven regulatory model. There's so far, only so far we're going to be able to successfully go on that route. So we are almost at the end of our time, but if anyone has a quick question, uh, I would slide that in. Yeah. My question is simple. What was your favorite part about writing the book? Oh. You know, I, I really... Um, the reason I write and, uh, is, is I never try to say the last word. There's nothing in terms of I, I know that it's a big topic and I wanted to learn about that. I wanted to have an analytical framework to think about um, sort of geopolitics and tech. And ultimately, it was most thrilling to work on the sections that I knew the least of. I love working on the sort of origins of Californian ideology, the idea that when you did have the sort of the hippies uh, in California with the venture capitalists and the kind of diverse communities sharing that faith in techno-optimism. And to me, it was really thrilling. There was much that I uncovered and the books that I got to read in, in trying to come up with all those narratives. Margaret O'Mara's The History of Silicon Valley, super fun. I loved learning about China. I really think that was, but that was where I really needed to, when you write a book like this, you need to be able to rely on a lot of people. And I talked a lot, I had tremendous Chinese students. I think one of my regrets is that, that uh, some of them did not want to be thanked in the book, but they were very hard in, in working. Uh, and then the book would never exist without just incredible work that they did. But also just what I learned about the stories being more nuanced. The idea that I had a very clear view of the market-driven, state-driven, rights-driven, and that's what I've had time to give you for. But ultimately, markets don't always win in the U.S., and I think you were very good at also sort of explaining the nuance behind them. And I, when I was able to write that story and say how China, too, if you look at the, the growth of the Chinese tech industry, you know, there's a lot of U.S. venture capital behind it. It's not just the roads leading to Beijing and subsidies. And the, the EU, too, it's a neoliberal project. 
they're pretty comfortable with markets. And there's a lot of also faith in the state, especially now with the EU's moves towards greater strategic autonomy. So every time when you kind of have a clear framework, but then when you can bring some more analytical layers and kind of learn more about um, uh, all those issues that seem very straightforward initially, and then still trying to have the goal that even though it's a complex topic and everything has an exception and another argument, you still have some clear frameworks that you want to come up with, come up with and, and some arguments. So ultimately, I think the, the whole thing, it was the breadth of it that was daunting, but ultimately very joyful. And the parts that I probably struggled the most with were ultimately most rewarding when you felt like, you know, I may not have fully nailed it, but I think it came together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Great question to end on. So this confirms my uh, suspicion that if I pick a great book and invite the right people, I can look brilliant without having to say <laughs> anything substantive for the whole evening. So this is really my chosen type of event. So once again, I'd love to thank Professor Bradford for her book and her talk and our panelists for uh, just really sharp and illuminating remarks. So thank you. Thanks, everyone.